Jen, do you want to uh, who's hold on one second? My printer's down, so I've got a double duty here and looking at our agenda. Um, is it Dr. Havens that's with us? Yes, but yes. us tonight. Um, I moved to panelists. So, uh, Dr. Havens, if uh, you should be able to unmute yourself. So, from the um, from NYU Langone Health, here to talk about mental health impact on our kids during the pandemic is Dr. Jennifer Havens and Aaron Relaford. Um, so, please thank you for joining us. And uh, please um, go ahead and begin anytime you like. Can you see us? Yes. Okay. Yes. So I'm I'm just the I'm just the MC here. Good good afternoon, good evening, everyone, and community board one. Um, we're delighted to be here. I'm Jennifer Havens. I'm the chair of the Department of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry at NYU Langone Health. And I also have a role with New York City Health and Hospitals doing strategic planning for child and adolescent for that system. And as Trish, are you the host? I am the chair of this committee. The and chair. then we have Jen Maldonado from uh, Community Board One, who's our moderator. Jeff Myhawk is our co chair. Uh huh. And who can we meet everybody just so we know who we're talking to since there's not a lot, not a lot, of, not a lot of people? Of course. Let's let's go ahead and introduce ourselves. So Jeff and I have gone. The rest of the committee can introduce themselves as well. Um, you. Hi. Um, my name is Sara Bataroni, and I have uh, two children in the New York public school system. One is in high school, and the other in middle school. God bless you. <laughs> Sarah, is that a virtual background? Oh, no, I've been coming into the office now. Okay. Everybody has been. Everybody's been called back, man. It's like the, the good days are over. <laughs> I, had a, I had a student who had a virtual background that had an active loop of someone coming in behind him and putting something out. And I thought we had to be like, can you please turn that off? <laughs> it was so distracting. <laughs> it was a video loop of a person walking in and putting something down and walking away just over and over. Was... Jeff, I wish I was that talented. Seriously. <laughs> Who else we, do we have from the board? Good evening. I'm Daron Charcutian. Been on the Youth Education Committee for a couple of years, and I have a daughter uh, who's finishing up kindergarten at the Texas School. Excellent. Thank you for joining us tonight. Oh, our pleasure. Who? Hi, Andrew Zelter. Uh, been a member of the committee for several years as well, and have. Four children, two of whom are in college and two of whom are in high school. And you're a teacher? No, I am not a teacher. No. Oh. Hi, uh, I'm Sarah Cassell, and uh, I've been a member of the Youth and Education Committee the last two years. I have a son who was born and raised in Battery Park City and uh, now is in college. Great. Is that everybody? Schools. No, we have more. Wendy. Um, I'm Wendy Chapman. I have um, actually two college age children now and uh, one high schooler. So. Rosa. Hi, my name is Rosa Chang. I am a community board member, but not a member of the youth and ed committee, although I sit in on a lot of these ones and I have a second grader at PS 150. <laughs> Great. So, um, again, I'm Jennifer Havens. Um, Aaron, you want to introduce yourself? Sure. I'm Aaron Relaford. Uh, I work with Dr. Havens here on uh, the Department of Child Psychiatry at NYU. I'm the Child Psychiatry Fellowship Training Director, and I also have a role where I'm the Director of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry uh, at NYU Brooklyn. Um, and uh, it's it's so good to be here. This is the second time I've gotten to present to uh, Manhattan Community Board and. Um, I, like many of you, have two young children. Uh, my daughter is, is seven, my son is, is four. And uh, so I'm really happy to, to, to come and talk to you about how things have been uh, during COVID. So, um, how, how do we share our screen? We have, we have slides, of course. We wouldn't be academic nerds if we didn't have slides. Um, so we wanna, right, share? Yeah. 
Dr. Hayden, it's, uh, I shared, um, well, past presenter roles over to you. So you should have screen sharing controls. If you look over at the top of your screen, um, there should be uh, a tab uh, uh, labeled as a share. And then you can, and then you hover your, your mouse over it. You'll see different options like share my file, share application. And if not, I'd be more than happy to share my, my screen and present the slides. Okay, maybe you maybe you should because I can't find the share button and I have a sure. technical person here with me, Aaron. Um, no problem. So, uh, just to give you a, um, uh, an overview, um, we've been quite um, affected in this entire country, but certainly in New York City by the COVID epidemic and Aaron's going to present in more detail. We're facing some really significant challenges right now in terms of the capacity of the kids mental health system to meet the demand. Um, and I'm going to let Aaron go through some of the general stuff. Obviously, this is an epidemic or a pandemic that affects everybody um, across all classes, demographics and races has particular impact on more vulnerable kids. But it's also an ep a, 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 a pandemic that affects adults and kids together, which is, I think, one of the reasons why it's so incredibly stressful. You know, we know what we know about sort of traumatic and disaster psychiatry and mental health is that the predictor of how well a kid does is how well their their family can support them. And I, I that's one of my um, theories about why this is so hard for the kids and we're seeing such increased rates of problems uh, because everybody is maximally stressed and it's obviously not good for kids not to go to school for a year and a half, nor is it good for their parents. I, I won't tell the story about the, the day I called Aaron and he was done with his two young kids, right? <laughs> so um, I'm gonna, Aaron, you, you wanna see, are you okay there? No, that's perfectly fine. I, I think that, um, <clears throat> I think that what you just said just now is is perfectly apt. Uh, I mean, starting off the story with with the parents and how challenging it has been for them. Um, you know, parents have had to juggle lots of things early in the pandemic, in the middle of the pandemic, before the kids went back to school. The parents were juggling work; they were juggling. Uh, you all were juggling work plus childcare plus being teachers as well to your kids. Um, uh, there was a lot of financial stress. People were losing jobs. Um, it was actually disproportionately, uh, women were disproportionately impacted uh, during this time, moms. And it was just sort of stressful all around. And it was a lot of uncertainty. And parents uh, had to manage their own mental health uh, as well as think about how this is impacting their kids. And kids, of course, you know, opening that story to what we're going to talk about today, um, you know, the kids really were struggling out of school, isolated from their peers. Um, they were missing a lot of milestones, really important religious transitions, graduations, a lot of things that 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 just kind of get overlooked that um, are really important that that kids just didn't get to celebrate, which are important uh, factors in, in the lives uh, in our lives uh, over time. And uh, I think an, another part of kids not being in school was that they were not monitored by teachers. They weren't monitored by administrators. And I think a lot of kids being at home in stressful environments were, were subject to uh, stressful homes and, and possibly abuse. And I think those things weren't being reported in the way that they have been before. And I think that that's also been challenges for kids. So, I mean, I'll start the story off from sort of the beginning. You can move to the next slide. I think she has control, Jen. Okay. Um, and um, early on in the pandemic, I mean, we, we didn't know much. Things were shutting down. Um, we initially had thought that that kids were not uh, impacted as much medically. And then there was this concern about this toxic shock syndrome. Now we're learning a bit that kids are are, are sort of do have some post COVID things. Um, early on, uh, we didn't have much uh, racial data on, on how disproportionately uh, kids uh, from different backgrounds were affected. Certainly, we started to understand that there was more anxiety and depression, uh, but the data wasn't as robust as we have now, which we'll talk a little bit about later. And then certainly there was traumatic stress, you know, people being in the home, being afraid of COVID, afraid to go outside, 
uh, being exposed to trauma in the home, as I mentioned. And, you know, there was the question of that developmental impact. Like how is learning on the screen? How is being away from other kids? How is uh, being out of school going to impact our kids? And so there, there was a lot of questions early on, not a lot of answers. You can go to the next slide. There was a great study that was done uh, in, in uh, I believe, March, uh, no, November. Um, summer, summer, last summer, yeah. Yeah, summer last year. And um, what it essentially talked about was uh, the, the financial, the economic impact on kids, um, as well as uh, some other factors. And what, what, we, what we learned from this study um, was that uh, certainly there were a lot of children that lost uh, caregivers. So in New York State, uh, there were about 4,200 kids who, who lost a parent or a caregiver. And, um, you know, one of the important factors that came out was that um, it, there were racial disparities there, right? So there were one in about uh, 500, 600 uh, African-American or Hispanic kids uh, that lost a caregiver um, compared to one in 1,500 uh, uh, Asian Americans, uh, as well as one in 1,500 uh, Caucasian Americans. And so that disparity was something that was was really interesting. Um, and then if you go to the next slide, it, it sort of, oh, you're gonna say something, Jim? Yeah, this was a, this was, this. you can get this study. It's, um, it was done by the United Hospital Fund. And if you go on their website, it's called the COVID ripple effect. And they were replicating some work they'd done looking at the impact of uh, opi the opioid epidemic on kids specifically. They did this just for New York State. So this is only the first six months of the pandemic. Uh, it's not the entire pandemic, but it was an immediate signal to us, you know, which we were figuring out pretty quickly that there was a very disproportionate impact in the populations of folks, particularly low wage earners, yeah. uh, you know, people who had to go to work, uh, uh, et cetera. So it was quite striking. But if you want this to see the study yourself, it's available publicly on the United Hospital Fund website. Yeah. And so, as I, I, I was mentioning, it was primarily looking at was what was happening early in the pandemic um, from March until July, um, and uh, the results came out in the fall. You can go to the next slide. So, uh, one thing that was interesting of those 4,200 kids that were in New York State in total, 57% of those kids that lost uh, a caregiver actually lived um, in the Bronx, Brooklyn, or Queens, in New York City. So in all of New York State, most of those kids were in, in New York City um, in these areas uh, that have high concentration of individuals from marginalized backgrounds. Go to the next slide. And um, what, what the study showed, which is kind of what we had suspected, was that uh, individuals from these marginalized backgrounds, people of col color were at greater risk of exposure. Uh, they lived in uh, multi-generational housing. They were sort of frontline workers, used public transit. They also were more likely to die uh, compared to individuals uh, from white backgrounds. Uh, and uh, what, it, what it actually highlighted was the social determinants of health. Um, those, those things that are sort of present in the lives of individuals from these backgrounds uh, who have challenges with uh, uh, finances, with food insecurity, and with other elements that, that make it challenging for them to navigate and move forward. These were the most vulnerable individuals, and they were the ones who were most at risk of, of getting infected and also dying and losing a caregiver. Next slide. And so as a result, there were thousands of kids, 325,000 kids, at least at that point, um, who as a result of the loss of a caregiver actually uh, ended up uh, shifting into poverty. Um, there was also a great number of kids uh, who were teenagers who were wage earners for this low income uh, group uh, that also lost jobs. Uh, and that also contributed to a lot of these children going into poverty. Uh, next slide. So this is sort of wrapping a bit up with, um, you know, some of the, the risk factors uh, uh, 
mental health wise uh, that are offshoots of some of the challenges that individuals from marginalized backgrounds face. And I, I always uh, want to highlight that there's uh, there's a new crisis of black suicide. Um, you know, uh, individuals who are black, they have had over the centuries and certainly this this century um, increased risk factors, trauma, uh, certainly financial hardships, uh, disparities in health care and, and, and many other things. And that certainly contributes to an increased mental health burden. But the, the risks of suicide have historically been very low. Um, however, in 2018, uh, suicide became the second leading cause of death in black children 10 to 14 and, and the third leading cause of death in blacks 15 to 19 year old. And uh, for black kids who were younger than 12, they were more likely to die by suicide than their white peers. I mean, what we've seen over the past three decades is that this trend has shifted, that there are more suicides percentage wise and actually numbers wise for uh, black children in this age group compared to their white peers. And that's been a significant shift. And there've been a lot of risk factors that we've, we've needed to look at. Um, you know, blacks have a lower rate of engagement and completion of treatment for depression. Um, individuals who've had suicide attempts, uh, they're less likely to have been diagnosed with a, a mental illness um, and even after having a suicide attempt, less likely to get treatment. And uh, there, are other, there are other factors that are contributors here, uh, particularly uh, increased access to uh, uh, firearms and increased mortality there. Next slide. But overall, you know, even outside of these marginalized groups, our kids have really uh, struggled during the pandemic. You know, if you looked at some of what has been happening with emergency room trends uh, during the pandemic, uh, particularly again earlier on, um, the, the emergency room visits dropped uh, dramatically for, for medical services, right? For non emergent visits, they dropped uh, from 32% to 27% and overall dropped by more than 50%. But even though medical visits dropped down, visits for suicide ideation, suicide attempts, double increased by 100%. And like I mentioned, kids who uh, usually would come to the attention of, of uh, authorities uh, for uh, having contact or experiences of abuse uh, or neglect, uh, those uh, emergency room visits actually dropped down by 89%. Uh, other studies, the CDC uh, reported that, that kids in mental health crises uh, actually increased in terms of their emergency room visits, 30% increase uh, for kids age 12 to 17 and 24% for kids age 5 to 11. Next slide. And to kind of uh, wrap it all up, this was a, a, a larger study uh, that didn't look at direct data. It actually looked at medical records of about 32 uh, million kids uh, in terms of insurance claims. It was from the Fair Health uh, Report in March 2021, more recent data, and it actually looked at uh, data that sort of transitioned even further into the pandemic. And what we've seen is that overall overdoses, intentional self-harm claims, substance use disorders, claims for depression, anxiety, they all increased substantially in 2020 compared to 2019. And uh, most of those spikes were early in the pandemic. I mean, thankfully, we're getting some progress with things opening up, but I think we're going to start seeing the, the results uh, of, of all of these challenges that were happening during the pandemic. Um, females, it seems to have more claims than males, right? There was an increase there from 63% to 71%, so proportionally more also, and uh, increased proportion of mental health claims compared to medical claims in the past. Um, you know, we certainly at the Child Study Center, as well as throughout the city, uh, have been using telehealth a lot more, which has allowed for increased access. Um, there are some challenges there, but it certainly has been a tool to allow us to be able to reach kids that really, really need help. And I think that's sort of the story is that kids are suffering in silence and, and, and you know, some of the traditional ways of kids getting help, particularly being in the schools and getting access to mental health care, they haven't been able to do that. We haven't been able to identify a lot of kids who actually need help. And we've had to think outside of the box on how to be able to get services to kids, but even before that, to identify kids that need help uh, so that we can prevent uh, you know, worse outcomes. So I'll pause here 
um, and sort of turn it back over to Dr. Havens. Yep. So, so I, this is really depressing, Aaron. <laughs> so, so, um, let me, let me say a couple of things, um, about the demand, the increased demand for mental health services, um, which I know I just said it was depressing, but I'm, we're really trying to, um, you know, seize the opportunity in this crisis. Um, you know, at baseline, New York City actually has a, a fairly good, relatively speaking, mental health system for kids and adolescents. It has a pretty robust system for the kids who are um, covered by Medicaid. Compare, I'm talking about compared to other states and other cities, lots of clinics. We actually have a fair number of inpatient, inpatient child psychiatry be beds relative to the rest of the country. Um, and we have a pretty robust private practice system for people who are upper middle class and wealthy. Actually, the most challenging situation in terms of accessing mental health tends to be for people who have commercial insurance um, because the commercial payers have been so bad about paying for mental health, so access is really an issue. But I, again, I do a lot of national work, so I'm just speaking comparatively. We know at baseline, one in five kids over the age of five has a mental health disorder with some level of impairment. So same stat, same uh, statistics that you find in adults. Um, we know even one in 10 young kids under five is gonna have mental health challenges. We know most mental illness starts in, at least in adolescence and often in childhood. And we know there's a group of really much more challenged kids that tend to concentrate, for example, in the child welfare system, kids that are removed from because of abuse and neglect. Um, and that's a complex multifactorial thing we can talk about later if we have time. Um, so, but we've tried hard in New York to respond in New York City to respond to and develop a, an appropriate system. It's always been challenged and always been usually seasonally because what happens is kids go to school and school's the stressor. So as the school year goes on, kids have more challenges and you see the entire child system starting to saturate. What we saw with COVID was, was really different because at the beginning of the pandemic in the spring, which is usually our busiest time on the acute side, by acute I mean inpatient child psychiatry, nobody was coming to the hospital for psych because obviously the COVID was overwhelming the hospitals and Actually, a lot of the beds that were, were in the system for kids were converted to beds for adult psych patients with COVID, and we didn't really need the beds at that point. And then as things calmed down over the summer, um, we started to see the demand increase. And then over the fall into the late fall, things have really been escalating. At, at, and at this point, we, what we see is our entire systems are saturated are across the board, the private system, the public system, the inpatient beds. Um, we, we generally, we, health and hospitals operates um, about 65% of the acute psychiatry beds for kids in New York City, because um, most of the private hospitals have gotten out of it because you can't make any money on it. And we generally speaking don't have any beds every day. And that's not typical. That happens usually in the late spring, summer for us. So a lot of high acuity kids, lot of definite increase in the severity of suicide attempts. And again, I see that at that's kind of an end point. Um, that's the sort of the, the high end, it's, but that's an, on an overlay of a lot of kids struggling with depression and anxiety across all classes and races as the point that the COVID report that Aaron was talking about makes is that, you know, the most vulnerable are always hit the hardest. But in this particular case, with the double whammy of loss and income, real, you know, job loss, um, that population is at the greatest risk. Um, and Aaron talked to you about the, the, um, reports to the state central registry, which are the, is the mechanism by which you report a concern about abuse and neglect. 
have have dramatically decreased because kids aren't in school, and that's where a lot of those reports get made. On the on the flip side, uh, reports about domestic violence have been on the increase. Uh, so we're we're thinking looking at really stressful home environments. Now, the, again, there is good news. Everyone's going back to school, right? Yeah, yes. <laughs> that's good news for the kids and the parents. Most kids are really resilient. And I think that the, the kids that have, again, as I said in the beginning, the the amount of support your family can provide you in in times of trauma really indicates how well you're going to do. Um, so I'm not worried about long term generation COVID, et cetera. It is revealing the real fragility of our mental health system for kids. And uh, the opportunity we're looking for here uh, as advocates, and I've spent a lot of my career on advocating about what the mental health service system should look like for kids, is to really try to expand the access to kids and adolescents to mental health services, and in particular, to move it earlier in life. So kids early, early in childhood and in elementary school can get identified and get the services they need because well, we can't necessarily prevent mental illness, we can certainly palliate it and treatment is a, the way that you palliate it. So you can have a fairly serious mental health condition, but be in good shape because you're treated. But the, the access to care has been such a challenge. So we're using this as an opportunity to try to really push our city and our state to move some of the resources in our mental health system to an earlier uh, time in life and to the places that kids and families really are. Like, so in primary care, when kids are quite young, in elementary school, in daycare, in pre-K, um, you know, I was on the phone, I was on a call today with OMH about what we need to do to make school-based mental health services more viable and more accessible. Because um, right now we wait for kids to get sick and then we take care of them and really we should be getting them quite early and holding on to them. So maybe maybe something positive will come out of, um, you know, the really difficult experiences we're having right now. Thank you both so much. I'm, um, I was thrilled that you were going to come and talk about this tonight because it's been the part of our conversations throughout this year, um, you know, as our kids were home. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, one of the things that came up over this time was, you know, your, your statistics didn't surprise me at all, um, as, as sad as they were. But one of the things that came up for a lot of us, especially those with teenagers, was that there seemed to have been at our schools in Community Board 1 and in our district, um, there, there was, you know, uh, there were extra guidance counselors put on and mental health profession professionals put on in some schools and some areas. Mm -hmm. But I'd like to hear your impressions about making it optional. If I, like for me, we, you know, to, to know a teenager is to know that they're not really um, wired to be preventative about much. <laughs> so, Except their homework, right? <laughs> I mean, so yeah. what you're seeing in the statistics is when the parents finally take them to the ER. You know, yeah, or, or they, yes, exactly. Yeah. Right? Or there's some event that takes them to the ER yeah. um, when they're not with the parents. But largely, um, I would imagine anyway, the parents are involved in that moment. Mm -hmm. And I'd like to know, you know, hear your impressions of what you found when you went around. I mean, I don't know how much liaising you do with our schools. Um, and if there's a reason that they continue to make these services optional especially when they have statistics that were rolling in at the beginning of the pandemic where they could see that a lot of these things weren't being dealt with it until they got to the hospital level. Um, so I, I'd love to hear your impressions on that and also about the fact that, you know, our insurance companies don't pay our mental health professionals a living wage and a lot of them as a result have to be private 
and okay. we're moving further and further away from our goal of making it accessible um, unless we face that. And we'd love to hear your experience with that as well. So these are these are great great questions, and we can stop sharing the screen so we can. Yeah, yeah, let's 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 look at each other. Jen, are you are you running this show? I think there's a Jen that's running this show. I am. <laughs> yeah, great. So I, I can start talking about this. These are great questions, Tricia, and 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 you know, there's a couple of really entrenched. Um, problems in the in the arena of mental health that are related to stigma and and ignorance i would say um you know we've grown we've learned a lot in the i've been in the field for about 30 years and we've learned a lot about the developmental course of mental illness and how things start earlier in life and what kind of challenges start earlier in life and a lot about what kind of family risk factors, uh, particularly early childhood adversity, how they relate to mental health problems. We've also learned a lot about how to treat um, even complex problems. We have much better evidence-based treatments. And by evidence-based, I mean they've been you know, carefully studied and randomized trials and been shown to work. There's a lot of suspicion of psychotherapy um, I, I personally believe it comes from the psychoanalytic world where people were seen, you know, multiple times per week without much efficacy in the 40s, 50s, and 60s, and 70s. And that, sorry, Aaron, I know you're, <laughs> that was the prevailing treatment model, and it was big in New York psychoanalysis. Um, and, and I think people sort of got this suspicion of, of mental health treatment, like, if you gave people access to it, they would just go there and stay and stay and stay, which I don't think is true at all in how people use services. But there also is this, um, if you think about the way healthcare has evolved, particularly healthcare for children, uh, when, you take, when you have a baby, you go to like 18 well baby visits in the first two years, and they're called well child visits, and they're considered to be preventive. And the point is to keep your baby and your and your child healthy. And when you go to those visits with your kid every year, the kid's height and weight is on a growth curve, and you're following that. And the pediatrician is using that to make guidance, to make decisions about whether a kid is developing health in a healthful way. We have no equivalent for that for mental health. No. You actually, on on, in order to bill for a, a mental health visit, the person actually has to have a psychiatric diagnosis. In other words, you have to be sick to get the services. So we have, we, this is really a, 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 a deep problem. The insurance companies take advantage of it. I don't know why. I don't know why insurance companies don't just say, let's get our people mental health because poor mental health affects all health outcomes. Um, but they have gotten away with that, um, and they are allowed to under-resource <laughs> mental health services. That's been the basis for parity law. You know, parity law came into being, <laughs> actually, it's an interesting story, during the, um, the, the financial collapse of 2000, when was that? 2008. 2008. Um, uh, Paul Wellstone and and um, Patrick Kennedy, Teddy's uh, Teddy's nephew, were working on parity law, federal parity law for years. And that parity law says you can't discriminate between mental health and health services, and how you out allow access to service, pay for service, re review services, and they could never get it passed. And they actually slipped it into the federal stimulus bill, the TARP bill. And that's the first time no one was really looking. And that's how we got federal parity. But parity has yet to be effectively um, uh, enforced as we're starting to do that in New York State. But there's also a mindset that we have to change, uh, which you know we have to understand that mental health is part of health. And there are treatments that work. People will not just go to the trough and drink them forever, which is a fantasy that regulators have it too. And that spending money on this, especially early in life, 
and for kids and especially for families that we know are at very high risk because of intergenerational abuse and neglect. The African American community is also affected by the sequelae of intergenerational trauma related to slavery. We know if we intervene with moms with young children who are, need help to be to be more attuned to their kids to deal with their own depression or trauma, we know that has an impact on child outcome. We should be spending this money, but it's a matter of political will. Um, our mental health system, I'm sorry I'm ranting here, but our mental health system is really designed to be reactive, to wait until you're sick and then to treat you. Much more emphasis on the adult side of the system. We in the child advocacy world say, the child, the adult mental health system has a budget and the child mental health system has an allowance. So mm -hmm. we're trying to change that. Um, but I, does that answer your question, Tricia? Yes. And I, the, the insurance companies are ridiculous. Uh, why they get away with, with this, uh, uh, I, I don't know. But remember, you know, the big ones are for profit. You know, right. it's been capitalized. That's, is there a curriculum that you share with the guidance counselors in the public schools, for example? I'm just curious in terms of, you know, our guidance counselors, which are spread way too thin, or maybe it's the principals, maybe it's teachers. Is there some sort of curriculum that you share with, with, with them, um, you know, things that you can do to make a difference in the early grades and, and, and along the way, or is this always individually based? Well, so, so that's a, another great question and um, the Department of Education and the private schools invest in guidance counselor staff, sometimes social work staff within their schools. They, they don't do clinical work. You know, they're not trained as mental, they're not necessarily, they're not functioning as mental health professionals, even though, even the social workers, um, they, they do have kind of a wall between the Department of Education staff and what kind of clinical role they can play. Um, teachers, you know, teacher training, teachers aren't trained about, about social emotional development. They're not trained about mental health challenges. That's not part of the education of a teacher. Um, so we don't, you know, we don't have the access or the resources to deal with the Department of Education staff. That would be expensive. I know they've done, Wendy, they've done a lot of work offering a lot of additional trainings during COVID, trainings in, to everyone in the schools, so the social emotional learning, training in trauma informed care, um, that coming from DOE. Um, but, you know, the best way to affect a school actually is to put a mental health service in the school, like on site, and to make sure the people in that mental health service have enough time to actually work with the school and do hands-on training and do hands-on identification, identification of kids. If I were in charge, every school would have a mental health service within it. Um, and Tricia, to your optional question, we would screen kids for things like depression, like we screen kids for height and weight, um, and that would be a normative thing we we do. We do that now in the in the healthcare system. We screen every kid over twelve for depression, and it's not an option. I mean, you can say I'm not going to answer those questions, but you, it's not like it, you have the Joint Commission, which regulates hospitals, makes us ask everybody those questions. So I think I think there's there's there there are things we can do. We can't take on the entire school system, Wendy, without I mean that should be like an educational imperative that DOE invests in. I don't understand why DOE doesn't spend some of their money on mental health, you know, because that it really tracks to the outcomes kids have. You know, the most of the kids that drop out of school have significant mental health problems. So everything they are evaluated by in terms of outcomes is affected by this, but um, everyone's expecting the healthcare system to take care of it, but there's not enough, you know, there's not enough resources and really important problem now with the increased demand. I think basically the demand has doubled from 20 to 40%. There's not enough workforce, you know, there are not enough 
they're not enough of us. They're not enough. There's only not enough child psychiatrists. There are 8,000 child psychiatrists in America. There are 80,000 adult psychiatrists. So we are, we are a subspecialty fellowship. So there are less of us. Huge demand now for social work, master's level clinicians. The, the entire mental health community is freaking out because DOE is going to hire 500 social workers to put in the schools. And, and we're like, where are we going to get our social workers? Because that's the primary workforce in the mental health clinics. Yeah. So, um, so, um, sorry, uh, just to follow up on Wendy's question. So isn't there a simple, like, you know, cheat, like a sheet telling them, please look out for these certain behaviors or symptoms just to re to, to flag it? Because I recently went through uh, an experience and it just shocked me the process of figuring out finally what was. So my son at school constantly had stomach problems. It was first the teachers thought, oh, you know, he just doesn't want to be in class. Then we went down the rabbit hole of, uh, you know, going through food allergies, then a GI. Then finally I went to the regular pediatrician and he goes, Sarah, this is manifesting in a lot of kids these days. It's all psychological anxiety. Like anxiety. It took us five months of hell to finally somebody tell us this would have been a very simple thing if the school had said, oh no, he wasn't going to the bathroom to avoid class. He actually, this could be something else, but they had no idea and I, and, and no blame to them. I, they're not equipped that way, but there's yeah. simple, simple things like watch out for these four or five things, uh, yeah. you know, so we, they can flag it early enough. Yeah, I, I, I wish it were that simple, um, uh, particularly in kids and adolescents, because you know, mental health challenges present a little differently in kids. Um, and I guess you could say, hey, if there are behavioral challenges that are new, or mm -hmm. if your kid starts doing poorly in school, um, or if your kid stops sleeping, or if they start pulling away from the family, right? But if you look on the surface, those things are very nonspecific and they could go for anything, which is unfortunately kind of what drove you to the rabbit hole. I mean, and physical symptoms too, right? Headaches, stomach aches, right? Uh, things like that. Um, you know, I think the best way and, and, and some of these educational initiatives really help the guidance counselors, the teachers to do is to recognize maybe some of these things to bring them to the attention of the parents or whomever. Um, but then as Dr. Havens mentioned, there's a lot of stigma, right? There's a lot of denial uh, which isn't the fault of of the parents. It's the fault of, you know, this has been the case for, you know, decades and centuries. Um, and I think sort of a, a growing awareness of mental health issues is certainly something. Giving talks like this, having people who are in administrative positions be educated about this, um, making it a bit more normative, right? Yep. And I guess that gets a bit back to Trisha's point of like making it making it required. Uh, I mean, if we had unlimited resources, unlimited uh, man and woman power, we could certainly do that. But in the absence of that, I think that's the path that we need to move towards is making it more normative, uh, making people aware of how these symptoms can be different in kids and adolescents and making them aware of the fact that, well, you know, it's not such a terrible thing if you go and have therapy and have some place to go and talk about the challenges that you have. You're, you're not going to be relocated to having to take a, a, a medication, the medication. And, and, and those are the things that are important. It doesn't important. mean you're crazy. And it doesn't mean you're crazy. It doesn't, it doesn't mean, mean you're crazy. crazy. Exactly. Yeah. I, I ran a clinic in the 90s for families affected by HIV, which was by definition substance abuse, because that was the vector for heterosexual spread. And, you know, these were very, very challenged families. And they would go to their medical doctor and their medical doctor would say, well, you know, we have this wonderful mental health service for you and your kids. And they go, what do you mean, doc? I'm not crazy. I'll go to substance abuse treatment, but I'm not going to the mental health provider. So I think, I think, I think it's an awareness thing. I think it's a normalizing thing. Remember what I said, one in five kids, the most mental health problems are much more common than health problems in kids and adolescents. Right. Much more common. So your kid having a stomach attack, a stomach ache, you know, that the that's in the differential. You have to make sure it's not a medical thing, but that's a very common presentation of, uh, but you know, the, remember the school staff are not allowed 
to diagnose kids. They're not and allowed to talk to that to that way. Got it. Uh, I mean, it's it's a challenge, and you're right because uh, you know we told our son maybe we should talk to someone, and it shocked me his initial reaction. He goes. Are you and daddy getting a divorce? And I was like, <laughs> and they're used to it from schools, apparently, that the kids that, you know, have this, they called it banana split. He goes, is this like a yeah, banana yeah, right. split? And yeah. I was like, oh, no, this is for other reasons. And it's, uh, it's, it's been like <laughs> interesting. Are, are we getting a divorce? And I'm like, no. But anyway, it's uh, anyway, it's it's, it's a lot. Sarah, that's good. They're doing that. They're talking about divorce in the schools. You yeah, know, there, yeah, this concept of social emotional learning that's penetrating. Yeah, you know, yeah. kids kids don't miss a thing. They know everything. So you know, to and the kids are much cooler than the adults are. Kids talk to each other about depression, and they're all talking about suicide all the time. Yeah. You know, yeah. you know the 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 studies on community samples of kids, like eighteen percent of kids think about suicide. It's and that probably tracks to the 18% of kids that have depression. They those things go along, not always, but so how do we make this like, you know, people have challenges and the harder your life is, the more difficulties you've had, particularly as a very young kid, the the higher the likelihood you're gonna have challenges as you grow up. So how can we just say that's the way it is? My friend Rahel Briggs, who started a big early childhood program at Monty. We used to say to mom, you know, they do the adverse childhood um, experience survey where you ask people about the 10 um, kinds of adverse child experiences you can have abuse, neglect, divorce, loss of a parent, incarceration, substance abuse in a parent, mental health disorders of parent, a couple other things. And then you say to the mom, well, listen, you've had five of these adverse childhood experiences in your life and look at how how what a challenge this has been for you i want to work with you your baby only has one now i want to work with you and your baby so your baby doesn't have any more mm -hmm. and that's an approach that's very effective with mothers who always mothers who don't want to deal with their own trauma don't want their babies to have trauma so but we do Getting those kinds of services to moms and young children is a real challenge. That's what I mean about pushing it down mm -hmm. and normalizing and, and having it be the expectation. Um, um, and and Trisha, I would think, you know, mandatory school screening for depression. There's actually evidence that the suicide prevention interventions that are educational, like where you talk to kids about suicide and why not to do it, are actually not effective what's effective is screening kids and identifying like the major risk factor for suicide or suicidal ideation which is depression mm -hmm. and you know as kids go through adolescence depression increases although younger kids can get to get full on depression depending on how stressed they've been in their lives very interesting anyone have any questions Yes. I hope we didn't depress you too much. <laughs> no, this has been we this has been a topic of discussion, as I said, during the, the whole pandemic, as we've, you know, all been crammed into spaces that weren't built to be in 24-7 with each other. Yeah. Are yes. supposed to be out socializing and interacting and growing. Yeah. And, you know, there have been lots of things we've never seen before in our houses. And so it's a really important thing to be talking about and advocating for, frankly, yep. you know, um, we did pass a resolution asking for mandatory um, services. And, you know, I, I love the way I love the word screening, because I think that is probably more useful. So I'll definitely yeah. take that with us and maybe incorporate it into our next ask in that department. So, along with, you know, affordable health care. And mental health care, yeah. They're shut out of, of being able to get help. I mean, yep. you know, yep. we looked at mental health providers that came with our health plan. Yep. And yep. it was a list of like 20. And I called each one, and 19 of them were either out of business or had moved out of state. And it was still the active list that the insurance company was using. Yep. yep. They get away with that. They get away I with could not, We have 20 providers near you in your within five miles of your zip code. And it turns out, you know, two were in Jersey city. And unless you're, you know, a bird, 
you you know it you don't get to crow fly yourself to Jersey City from Lower Manhattan very easily. So I think that there were so many, um, like you said, I think they did a lot of it just to make it look as though they had this vibrant database full of providers. Yeah. But when you drill it down, there were probably one or two in all five boroughs willing to work for the hundred and ten dollars. Exactly. Uh, because they don't have they don't have to in New York because there's so many wealthy people that can pay more. That's fast. It's that's really true in New York City in particular. Yeah. Uh, and it's sad because there's a lot of people who can't and then they're shut out and the schools aren't offering it. Right? So then there's no, there's no route out for them. I and think it's a matter of political will. And that's why, you know, unfortunately, I've been in this business for a long time. Uh, disasters usually do good things for us. Mm. But, but like after 9 11, when the firemen had PTSD, post traumatic stress disorder. That really normalized yeah. that you can have a really bad reaction to a really bad stress and still be like a normal person. Right. And so, you know, we're always leaping on these kind of terrible things because they allow us to move the needle a little bit on understanding and ability to commit resources. So well, that, that's the best we can do. I can't thank you enough for coming. This has been really informative and uh, we'll be taking some of these ideas forward with us. I think you're right about it being an opportunity. So sooner rather than later, we should all be advocating for not only normalizing it, but um, figuring out ways that we can incorporate and support our vulnerable communities who this is largely out of reach for. So thank you both. And so look, we, we can sit in the same room without a mask. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> I know. Amazing. Yep. So right, take care. You keep up your good work. Thank you Thank so you. much. Thanks for coming. Really appreciate it. Right. You're right. Um, next up is um, Sarah Jones and Susan Diaz from the Office of Community School at Department of Education to talk about the updates on the Summer Rising program. Welcome. Hello, Susan Diaz and uh, Diane Arweiler. Oh, okay. For last yes. name. I'm with you both as panelists, so you should be able to speak. Hi, I'm Diane Arweiler. I'm from DYCD. Nice to be here with you all, and thank you for having us. Welcome. Hello. Hello, everyone. This is Susan Diaz from the Department of Education. Um, we're going to be talking about Summer Rising, and I'll see if um, our colleague Sarah Jonas is on as well. And let me try to get my video on. There's a call in number. I'm just going to unmute them, Trisha, to identify if that individual is Sarah Jones. Okay. Uh, call in user 1732. Uh, is that you, Sarah Jones? Jonas. Oh, I'm sorry, Jonas. Hello. Colin, you can you please identify yourself? No, I don't, I don't, I don't believe that. I can I, actually um, start um, and then if she if she joins, that's that's great as well. Okay, great. Thank you. Welcome. Okay. Thank you. Um, so I'm here just to talk a little bit. Hello, by the way. Um, I'm Susan Diaz with the Department of Education, Office of Community Schools. And we have been tasked with supporting the launch of Summer Rising. Um, as well as on the DOE and supporting um, the SYEP initiative. And so Diane is also here to um, answer questions about SYEP as our partner, um, our, our partner at DYCD. So um, I'll just start by telling you a little bit about um, Summer Rising. <clears throat> 
and our um, the initiative that we've recently launched for all children, all students across our city, um, regardless of whether you are in a DOE school or not. So it's a full day and in-person experience for grades K through five, five days a week, eight to six, Monday through Friday. Um, and it's starting July 6th and going through August 20th. Um, and it's gonna be staffed by DOE um, teachers and staff, as well as community-based organization staff. And this is where we partner with the Department of Youth and Community Development for the Summer Rising Initiative. Um, and they have been working with community-based organization providers to help support this work and launch. Um, so we also have programming for grades six through eight, which is four days a week, um, 8 a.m. to 4 p.m. Monday through Thursday with the same dates of July 6th through August 12th. For high schools, we are offering um, course uh, credits, um, bridge programs, and each individual high school has its own separate program. We are also working with the Department of Youth and Community Development on their SYEP initiative and supporting that work within our schools as well as the larger community. So um, just to name for enrollment, if anyone would like to enroll in this program from K to eight, they would go on to the Discover DYCD website, create a, an account um, with the city and um, and all the prompts are there. It's it's accessible in 72 languages. Um, and enroll in the the program. Um, and then once young people, once a young an application is in, then um, the student will this the families will be will get outreach from a community based organization directly about their application and about enrollment. Uh, 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 for our students should have already enrolled um, and DYCD is now going through the lottery process for their community-based initiative, initiative as well as for their school-based initiative. Um, enrollment is happening um, as we speak for, for all of that for a July launch. So we are definitely doing all the rigorous health and safety protocols. We're working really closely um, with the Department of Health on ensuring that we are up to date on all of our information um, for the summer as well. Um, and our timeline um, for families to enroll is right now um, and being able to um, have every single school connected to a program is our goal. Um, and we are, are, are there in terms of being able to have every community-based, every school be connected to a community-based organization in order to offer this program to all um, New York City residents who are students. So that so is it for a presentation. Um, and we're happy to answer any questions you have about the Summer Rising Program and SYEP. I have, um, thank you so much, Susan. I have a couple quick questions and I wanna open up to the, the committee. Um, are these all in person? Yes. yes. They, for the Summer Rising K-8, to eight, they okay. will all be in person experiences. Mm -hmm. um, and then for SYEP, um, Diane, if you want to share the, the nuance there with um, the in-person versus the virtual. Thank you, Susan. Yes. So, so for SYEP this year, for the participants ages 14 to 21, there's options for them. They have an in-person option, hybrid option, or a virtual option. So depending on which provider the participants do select and what the providers have to offer, the participants will be able to choose one of the three. 
Okay, wonderful. And are these all academic? Is there some social emotional programming? What are the offerings? Do you have that yet? Yes, um, we will be offering a combination of social emotional supports as well as academic. So we are hiring um, DOE teachers to provide what is you would typically think of as summer school. So academic supports that that um, continue um, the curriculum that they had um, that our students had had begun this year, um, as well as having social emotional supports um, and enrichment activities for all of our our young people. Right. And is there a some sort of a qualification? to engage in the academic courses do they have to have failed in other words the course or do they have an option of bettering their grade what could these classes let's say a child had a d in algebra one or a c and they wanted to see if they could better their grade would they qualify to be able to take advantage of the summer school program offered for algebra one so that I would have to get back to you um, for our high schools in particular, if a student has failed a class, they will be able to make it up. And we have a course catalog um, for families, both in the public school and non public school um, system to be able to review and um, and find out where that course is offered throughout. So, so for our students that could are potentially going to who who will uh, potentially fail this course um, they'll be able to do um, makeup but I don't know if we're offering um, students to accelerate um, each individual high school is offering its own programming that's specific and targeted to each population mm -hmm. so um, if if there is a question for a specific school um, you can reach out directly to the school and find out um, okay. about what's being offered at that school. Has everybody here who has, ha has everyone received correspondence from their schools on this? I'll be curious to hear from the committee members. Anybody want to chime? I, I have, but with pretty much no explanation what it was. My wife got the correspondence and was like, I don't know what this is. And because I'm on this committee, I knew kind of what it was. So I was like, the way it was written, it sounded like all of a sudden um, the the youth rising was taking over from from um, Bob Townley's uh, after school organization. She was like, "I think we have a new after school provider." I'm like, "No, no, no! It's a whole, whole other program." Right. So. I, got it, I got it from one of my uh, schools, uh, one of my kids' schools, and they they explained it, and it was uh, clear to clear to me from one of them, not the other. Yeah, yeah, I would say it's not been clear at my son's high school. Um, and and be, uh, everyone should answer, And we, but I have a follow-up question later on, just if we could relate back to what's happening in Community Board 1 specifically, but you can get to that later. Thanks. This is Rosa. We, we got um, notification through our school, but the, um, I guess because our school is very small, um, the opening, I guess, at the other school that you're serving feeder school to didn't happen until very recently. And, uh, but there, it just, it seems very, um, ambiguous. I'm really happy that you guys are here to talk about the program because it basically said there's going to be academics and there's going to be like social emotional and there's going to be, uh, outdoor playtime, like camp. That was about it. There, there was no further details um, in, enough for somebody to be able to make that judgment of, OK, do I feel comfortable doing this or what exactly is this? Or is this like a fly by the seat of your pants kind of thing um, where it's sort of being made up as we go along? And so um, I heard like one thing for me that was a little, um, I guess, caused a little bit of hesitation was just the hours. I think that the fact that you have such a long range of hours is great. I think that for like, say, um, my child, that would be too much in any given day. Um, but then I heard through someone else with a grapevine that um, you could actually pick up earlier 
then at 6 p.m. And so um, it's, there's just, there isn't enough detailed information for people to be able to make up their minds basically. So if enrollment is down, then that might be why, because nobody has any information and not much is posted on your website. So we do have a, a family facing website um, on New York City um, on New York City site, and I can definitely send that um, so you can also direct families to that site, um, which will outline each step. Um, the critical piece is for families to create the login um, and then apply to um, their school's affiliated site. Um, and you can also reach out directly to the community based organization that is part of the affiliation site. Um, and they have, you know, been been doing summer camps for many, many years and they ha will be able to give you a good picture directly of what is going to be happening at your individual site. In addition, obviously, to to um, to the school team in terms of the academic portion. And along those lines, um, what is what what are the schools in Community Board One that are participating, and what is the community based organization that's supporting those schools? So I would um, encourage you to log onto the website, and I can actually do that right now. Um, I'll share that every school is somehow affiliated, so there won't be a school that would be left out in your um, community board, but for a specific list, you can add in the zip code as a search function um, and be able to um, populate exactly what, um, what schools um, are offering. So, like, one of the, our zip codes is, you know, 10007 and the ones 10013. Um, what are the other zip codes in our neighborhood? I'm just curious. Other people speak up. I know those two. Uh, 10038. 10005. Wendy, I know that um, PS276 is a school that has programs, PS89. Um, has elementary services. I think PS 289 has middle school. Weirdly, they're both run by different agencies. I think one. Yeah, I was going to um, say, and then what's the nonprofit there? The, or the so community it's, community? I think it's CPC for PS 276 for elementary and for PS 89. But bizarrely, at 89 and 289, they're 289, I believe. The middle school is Manhattan Youth, and the um, elementary school is CPC. And um, I'm trying to remember what else okay. I'm looking at. But I feel like pretty much all of them were CPC, at least for elementary when and, I was And what is it. CPC? I can ask Susan to answer that question. Yeah. It's the, the Chinese Planning Council. It's a community-based organization that works in your area. Oh, okay, that's news to me. Okay, thank you. And we've we've worked closely with them for for many years on summer camp programming, so they're very familiar with um, with summer camp. So each of our schools, something is going on at each of our schools. Each of your schools has an affiliated site, so it may not be in that building. We've okay. consolidated to maximize resources. Gotcha. Um, but if you log on to the Discover DYCD website, which I will definitely share okay. um, with you, you would be able to see exactly what schools um, and where are affiliated in and your they register, not there, but on the NYC.gov. Yes. yes. Okay. All right. Okay. Um, anyone Thank have you. any other questions? There's something very new this year. I mean, obviously they're going to be in person, which was good to hear. But um, is there anything really different this year versus other years? The coordination 
is um, a big uh, difference from last year. Last year, you either did summer school or you would do summer camp through the DYCD programming. Um, but now all children, all of our students have the opportunity of have of having a really enriched um, experience um, moving forward. And so we have done models. The Office of Community Schools has done this model in the past on a very small scale, um, but this is going to be a, a larger scale where every student who, who, who wants to participate can participate, which is different um, from period from previously. I have a quick and question, Susan. Is are all of these classes? I remember um, someone had reached out to us saying summer school um, previously was a recorded teacher on a huge screen and sixty or seventy kids sitting in an auditorium logging into say that algebra one class. Are all of these academic programs taught by live teachers in the flesh? And if so, what are the class sizes? What's the structure? So that would be a question for the high school team in particular, because our elementary um, school programming has very specific Department of Health ratios that they need to meet. So class sizes cannot um, exceed, uh, I believe it's 25, but for our high schools, it could be different. Um, I would just share that um, unless you are mandated for summer school, you would not necessarily have the option to do um, virtual. Okay. And I just wanted to share with you guys the platform so that you could see it since I was able to share my screen now. auditing this? I mean, do you have people going around and checking? Because, you know, one of the things that um, my son, you know, who's now in high school, but when he was in um, middle school, he actually had the chance to participate in um, two different locations. And one was really enriched. And the other one was literally a bunch of kids on their phones. And there were basketballs in the gym if they wanted to play with like nothing going on all day long, day after day. Um, you know, how do you, how do you touch base with quality issues, uh, provider to provider or with, even within the provider uh, program to program? We do do um, quality reviews for each of the organizations that we work with. And so um, if, if there is a concern, we have a few ways parents can reach the Department of Youth and Com Community Development directly, and they can send someone out to do an in-person visit right away. So, so for instance, if you call uh, the, D the Department of Youth and Community Development Youth Connect hotline, which we can also share, um, or even 311, we would be able to to gather information from you and then um, have someone go out and see the programming um, and verify. And then we we have a quality review process that the Department of Youth and Community Development goes through every year for every sing, single one of their contracts. Susan, if you can uh, share that information over to me and I can paste it on, on that chat, that'd be great. Thank you. That would be helpful. Thank you, Jen. Anyone else have any questions about this? Read about funding at all for this year, or did the funding really come through? That question, I don't know. Um, I'm not sure what the specifics are about funding. Um, I, I do know that I think this year is sort of an anomaly because of the the budget, the funding that's coming in from um, the federal government for summer. But I would say that in the future, it, it could be an issue and it might possibly be an issue now. It would be other folks that would be able to answer that question for you. Sorry about that. So, 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 so 
do, do I understand it correctly that basically this program existed all along and it's just been hyped up with the federal funding this year and sort of make up for the potential learning loss due to coronavirus and remote learning and all of that stuff? Or is this actually like a completely new endeavor? Because I didn't know anything about this prior to this year. And I'm just wondering if I was just totally ignorant or if, it, if this is totally new. Well, components of the programming are not new, but this actual summer rising initiative um, is a completely different way to do summer school for us. So the community-based partners that you're working with at these locations have had um, have had programs running at these locations for years. So it's not like they're just creating something from scratch. They actually are experienced in doing this work at these locations and and building upon an existing um, an existing program essentially. Yes, yeah. many of them have been um, running programming in those particular sites. Others, we are um, trying to expand programming um, at uh, other schools. So it's a combination. Okay, thank you. And are you helping with um, uh, you know, any of these organizations? Are they having trouble hiring people? Or, or are they going to meet their employment numbers? Um, you know, I know that that was a, that's an issue for some summer camps, for example. Yeah, I'm not really sure. Um, that would be someone else who could answer it for you. And I will take down that question and see if we could get back to you. That would be great. Rosa, this is, this is Wendy. I think... Um, you haven't experienced it yet because uh, the middle school programs are city funded. And um, so they, the middle school programs, a lot of our kids have been doing. And that um, is something that's, you know, uh, they, you know, parents in the neighborhood know about. Um, it's different for elementary. So this is kind of new for us. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Any other questions? Fantastic. Thank you all so much, Diane, Susan, thank you so much for joining us. That was super helpful. And if um, Jen, if you can take the contact or the information they gave us in terms of the website, I'm going to put together a blast um, to send out to families. Sure. Uh, Susan, since you have my email um, address, the staff one at CD, you can uh, follow up offline. That'd be great. Thank you. Yes, I will do that. I have your email and I will. Um, gather the information requested and then send that off to you. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah, it's wonderful the city's doing this. Thank you. Thank Thanks you very much for coming. Appreciate so it. much. Take care. Thank you. Have a great night. You too. You too. Um, and then our last two couple of items. Uh, the timing is really unfortunate um, because I'm just about to find out a lot um, in these coming days. I even thought about postponing the meeting, a good day to go to. So if I get great information and if I feel as though uh, it is worthy of a resolution, then I have talked to Tammy about putting one out and circulating it and calling a meeting before the full board. Can I just take a quick poll by a show of hands? And if you have your camera on, you can just stick your hand up. If you don't, you could put your hand up in the um, chat or the participant place where you put your hand up um, to let me know whether you would be available at like 5.30 on uh, right before the full board meeting. One, two, Darren, Judith. We have one, two, three, four. We've only got four of us available at that time. I know it's tricky. You have me, uh, Trisha, Wendy. Yeah, I've got Wendy, Sarah, Judith, and Darren, and myself. So we we still don't have a enough that I'd feel comfortable passing a resolution. Um, oh, and Andrew. Okay, so we have. Oh, we've got six. So. Um, 
so maybe, and we're missing a couple people tonight. So that's pretty good. All right, I'm going to consider this. And so, um, just know that I'm going to be getting information on. Um, uh, well, you, you all probably saw the letter that I co wrote with community board 2. did everybody see that? Yes, no. Yes, yes. Good, good letter. Okay, good. So we're waiting to hear back. From the city on that letter with what, you know, they're going to do about the situation. I got an email today that they had opened the wait list. So they listened to 1 of our, um, our uh, points, which is good. Uh, 1 of the things that was worrisome is that they were going to wait longer. To hear back from people, at, especially those that got a specialized. And a choice offer, and so we're hoping that they move to. Resolve that sooner rather than later. Um, it's also incredibly unfortunate that some people got a specialized offer and then no choice offer, but some did. Um, we had a really interesting, if not disturbing selection of responses when we went to our middle schools to find out what happened there. But the upshot is, is that from 47 to 50%, we had people getting their first to sixth choice, um, which is very low compared to what we're used to, obviously. Um, and then we had another big chunk that got six to 12, but then we had the most shocking that was nothing at all or a school that most parents had never heard of. Um, and that was the part where we really felt that given the fact that they decided to do this because of the pandemic, that if they were going to change the model, an ounce of planning would have been useful. Um, and uh, so, you know, also the fact that people are not familiar with the schools that are unscreened that are with, you know, they did it by geography in most cases, but they could have stood to, to spend more time on that and fortify the schools before doing this to make parents really more on board for the new model. Um, and they're not on board at all. Um, and they're actually extremely concerned, especially those who got nothing or the assigned school. So um, what we found out since then is that they responded that they are considering the question about appropriate placements. Um, because a lot of these schools that the kids were um, sent to are CT schools, they're trade schools, they're specific um, in terms of what the curriculum is. And, you know, it's it was so random that it really had nothing to do with the child and it had nothing to do with choice. And um, so we are hoping to hear back from them as to what the process is going to be and what they're going to guarantee to those families that got nothing or that got assigned. And we're hoping that that is imminent because people are making plans. And uh, we're hoping that by opening the wait list today, it means that they have asked the families with multiple offers to resolve them and also accept the offers and show intention to, to come in the fall for those who did get a public school offer. It's gonna be really important that families that are not coming back release their acceptances because they obviously don't have enough seats if there are matches that aren't even, there's no match at all. Um, so so they're, they're gonna have to resolve this obviously, and we're gonna continue putting a lot of pressure on them. I was told by our district superintendent's office that they care very deeply about what community board one and two think um, in terms of their decisions. So that's why we wanted to partner with them. Um, because together we are more powerful. So um, I'll let you know what we find out. But I thought if anybody had any questions that I could answer, you could ask them right now. Actually, I just have a quick question. Is it uh, there's a perception and uh, I wanted just to see if there's any truth to it that it was predominantly downtown uh, families and schools that were hit families, downtown families that were hit the hardest or district two. Is that any truth to that or just a false perception? So far as we've found, I don't have statistics on community board three. Um, 
but from what I have heard thus far, it is pretty much across the board. Um, but there definitely was the intention. One of their goals was diversification. So I can't be much sure, sure what's happening in neighborhoods that were prevented from coming to district two previously. So that's a really important thing to say in terms of high school. Um, I did find out that, I mean, here's an example. Uh, LMC sent 28 kids to Millennium last year and the year before. This year they sent two. So this is the thing that's shifted dramatically. Um, LMC had one of the largest percentage of kids um, with no offer and um, assigned to five or six different unscreened schools nearby. Um, although the West Village did too. Um, their CB2, you know, their middle school, Morton Street, had a pretty, for considering the size, they had uh, a, a large amount of kids have no offer at all. So, you know, it's hard, it's hard to say, Sarah. Um, you want to think that they did something equitably. Um, but, you know, from where I stand, if you're going to make this dramatic of a change and hope that families embrace schools they did not even choose 1 to 12, that you might want to spend some time fortifying them, advertising them, holding tours, open houses, things that you do when you are looking at, I mean, this is what you do when you go to high school, right? You go to the high school fair, you talk to your friends, where are they going? You look at the, the curriculum, you look at the acceptance rates, you look at the college readiness, you try to find a match for your child because we have a choice system. So if you decide to go to a lottery system when you have a choice set up, that's obviously not a great setup to begin with. So when you want to try to combine those two things, you really have to take the time to do the outreach to the parents and uh, bring them up to speed on these other schools. And frankly, you know, they, they need to even the playing field in terms of resources, because as long as parents are providing infrastructure, which we've talked about here ad nauseum, you're never going to have equality, right? If we're, if we're raising money that enables us to have resources that other schools don't, then it's going to be very difficult because everybody's going to want to come to those same 20 schools with the resources. So, you know, if you hear teens take charge, which is this group, I'm going to pop over to the CEC meeting after this meeting. When you hear them speak, there's two things happening. There's the fact that there isn't enough racial diversity, but there's also and arguably a larger focus for our underserved communities in resources. You know, they kept saying over and over again, the schools with the resources are in Manhattan, the high schools. Why is that? Why are we kept away from those schools? Why don't we have the right to go to those schools? And so it's multifaceted. We need to be creating resources first, in my opinion. And then we talk about, you know, and, and level the playing field in terms of, of that piece. And then we can create great schools everywhere and stop with this facade that our schools are better in some way. We just have more resources. And I think, you know, whenever you have more money, you can do more things. And, uh, and every school in every borough should have that opportunity. So really all they're doing right now is opening up the city to all scramble for the same schools with resources. Failed approach, period. So, I think that it, their, their, their intentions are in a great place, but the procedure, not so much. And I think we have a lot of work to do. And certainly over time, we've certainly got a lot of money too right now. And we have this opportunity to really make some changes across the city in terms of these resources. But, you know, I'm worried about this, this regime because they've had they received 22 million in March of 20, as you might have seen in the resolution, just specifically earmarked for ventilation and window repairs in our schools so that come fall, we had 
proper ventilation in our schools to all go back. They have done next to none of it, like next to none of it. And that was my concern about this coming fall is that we're not going back to school if we have 30% of our schools that have no ventilation and windows that don't open. And this is a real concern. It's not something that is far fetched. Um, and we have to continue to put a lot of pressure on the Department of Education and the School Construction Authority and the mayor's office, frankly. It really comes from the mayor's office the more I talk to our principals. So, and unfortunately, you know, we have the same mayor who's been making decisions up to now in office as we start this school year. So we really do have to be um, really vigilant. So, so that's my, my high school update. Um, and then in, in terms of Trinity Place, oh my God. So Rosa, thank God, Rosa sent me the presentation that the SCA made to PS150. And it was a PowerPoint of a document they made in what they said was 2019. In 2016, October, we went through a huge thing with them about the gymatorium in that school. We fought, we took it to the task force. We got every elected official behind us. Bob Townley and I gathered data from all of the gyms and auditoriums, not only in our community board, but in community board two and three. And we did, we analyzed the data for the usage in our gyms and auditoriums. And what we found was the gyms were being used seven days a week to the point where there was hygiene concerns. And then we had the gym at uh, the auditoriums at 65%. So we pitched Carmen Farinia at that time saying the loss of programming would be substantial at Trinity Place. We had seen the problems at Peck Slip. They had to close the street because they don't have enough space because of the gymatorium to have gym, a performance. And then if it rains, everybody comes inside, no recess. It was a disaster. We finally closed the street over there after much anguish. And so we presented and they agreed to step down and make a gym and an auditorium at that school. It was probably one of the best advertised things ever. It's in three magazines and newspapers. We have the minutes from the task force. We have minutes from CB1. Um, I, I don't know what to say, but they sent the PowerPoint out with the gymatorium in it. So I called Mike Marisola, we wrote a long letter. He wrote back saying, you know, you should be happy. We have a stage in the full size gym. And there is still space. The space that was earmarked for the auditorium is indeed still in the plan. This is important to say. So we are wondering why they then built a stage upstairs because they can seat 140 in this multi-purpose rooms that they combined. They are not opening a pre-K. They kept that part of the bargain. No pre-K, two multi-purpose rooms combined to one, seats 140. And I noticed that in the plan, there's a platform there, and there's also a door to a backstage area. So that actually looks like an auditorium in the space they said was gonna be the auditorium. We have to figure out why they built a gymatorium upstairs. And my concern is that it's because when it went to build, they went to build this gym, they realized they might not be able to do a regulation gym in this space. And if the space was long and too thin, they might've hoped that by building the stage and marketing as this multi-purpose, wonderful gymatorium room again, that we could, have other events in there. So I sent Michael Marisola the dimensions of a full size gym and asked him to confirm the size of the gym. I have not received an email back. Tammy is on that as is Lucian and community board too. So we're, we're gonna wait and see what he comes back with in terms of how big that room is. Um, I will say the plans max the space so that if the width does not end up being the 50 feet that it's supposed to be, then it never had the space to begin with and they just weren't forthcoming with that at that time. It's not like they can make this any wider, in other words. It is wall to wall. 
there is definitely room on the length. So we are going to look into that. Like if they were to take the stage out, they could definitely get another 15 feet in length. So I will be getting back to you all as to what the upshot is of that, but there's rumors going around about this. I wanted to make sure and clarify the facts. Those are the facts um, and give you guys a chance to ask some questions if you have any. Thanks, Trisha. I, I think this is um, when we throw hissy fits in meetings and we get told how we're being ridiculous, we have to somehow make sure that this is part of the for folklore going forward when we're all long gone, you know, because these things take so long and the collective memory is what they count on. You right. know, it just happens a few of us just keep sticking around. Well, we I remember we I sent him the correspondence. I mean, he's got it. It's got to be really for for them to say it's been a gematorium all along and then have to face the email I got from Carmen Freña herself confirming that there was no gematorium has to be humiliating for the SCA. I, I don't think it's humiliating. Oh. At I think it's I think it's just annoying. I, that's might, what I think it is. I think it's annoying. It's not humiliating. And I think the other piece of it is is that. Um, this is why we spent hours and hours and hours. I mean, I, I'm, I'm actually offended how much time I spent yeah. on all of those things. And then it just doesn't matter, you know, and, it, and that's the way I feel about a lot of this stuff with the DOE. It just doesn't matter. And they honestly, I mean, I, I mean, I, I asked years ago, I asked Scott Stringer, to do when he was, you know, just taking the job as comptroller to do an audit of the DOE, because I feel like they're not on the up and up the school construction authority. And I feel like this is a classic example that they're not on the up and up, you know, right. and, um, and there's, you know, we'll get to it later on, but of course, also the lineup, uh, how many hours did we spend really worrying about how are we going to get in and out of this building because there's no ground floor gathering space. And oh, by the way, I'm sure the the ground floor uh, store that they're going to try and lease out is going to be part of the millions and millions of empty storefronts all over right. you know, this, this city. There's going to be an empty storefront that could be a first floor gathering space you know, just on the other side, probably for years to come, because it's a terrible location. Nobody's going to rent out that commercial space. Right. Um, and what's happening with the lineup and how are people going to get in and out of this building? And it's, this is a problematic space. And we worried, we discussed how busy that road is with all the buses and how people are going to cross the street. You know, I just don't feel like, any of those things mattered. <laughs> well, they did. I mean, the DOT fairly, um, you know, we lost this item to the transportation committee, as you remember. So now we right, get to right. two meetings to get our information. Um, they they said that um, the South Plaza is is their recommendation. They are, you know, and I think they came to that conclusion because they have to push out that sidewalk because of mechanicals for the building. So they went ahead and, and proposed that they close the westbound lane of Edgar Street. That is the recommendation. And they will then connect that with the courtyard. If they do, that provides an adequate amount of space. It's an extra 1500 square feet, um, at least, probably more. But how do we know when that's gonna happen or not? Well, I mean, by, by writing an email every six weeks. Right. So, which is what we've had to start doing. And the bus is not going to be on Trinity Place. I, that I also heard. It's going to be on Greenwich. So that is a good thing. And it will connect with that uh, plaza. Okay. So that will be left off right on the plaza. No, no crossing the street. There's okay. no way that there's ever going to be a bus crossing on Trinity Place. I mean, if they do that, then we're like, then I've lost all hope. But right now, they have, they're talking about the bus stop being on Greenwich. And, and frankly, they haven't changed the plan. So they, what they might have done is just called it a gym and hoped that we didn't notice it wasn't regulation size. I don't know how they could 
think we wouldn't get it because we're so focused on a full size gym. We only have three of them in nine schools. So we need a full size gym there and we might not have the width. The, the reality is that building might not be wide enough. And, and I don't think we have been told still how people are getting in and out of that building. Like, are the children able to take this, the elevators or, I mean, they, you know, there's three so elevators. You walk in uh, from the courtyard in front of the Dickey building. The, the entrance is going to be doors facing south. The, the doors are going to open. You're going to walk into an elevator bank with three sets of ele three elevators. Okay. So and, remember, they're going to be able to use those. Yes, but it's not a lot of indoor space. And when I asked Michael if they had plans to put a covering on the courtyard, at least part of it, he said no. So you'll be standing out in the pouring rain waiting for people to go up the elevators because there isn't room for all the children to be in that elevator bank lobby. So, you know, that would have been an, a, a slam dunk to put a covering over that. You know, what Tammy and I came to is that I, I'm not used to having to be in design meetings from the moment they approve something. But today I sat in on a Harbor School meeting because they haven't moved into the design phase. And I'm so concerned because of what happened at the gymatorium that I'm, I'm insisting on design pre design meetings at the Harbor School over this pool. And I, you know, it's going to be necessary because they are not really looking out. They don't see the demand for a full size gym as a thing. I think they feel like I think right now they're going to take advantage of this pandemic um, and say, well, you're under enrolled in in lower Manhattan. I don't think they haven't gone there. You know, I think they're more what they're more likely to do is um, we have to watch that they don't put those, you know, another school in there like a D75 or something else would be more likely. Um, if they do think the school will be under enrolled. Um, but from what we understand, it's still a choice school. PS 150 is really defining the school. And, um, and is it a choice school like 150 that the first preference is you live in community board one and then it goes from there? So this is a big point of discussion right now because they're getting rid of that model. So um, it's like a blessing and a curse to be a choice school, but seeing that it's elementary. I'm thinking that it's probably going to be choice among the large zone that is CB1. You know, they probably are not going to zone it for Tribeca first or FIDI first. I no, would no, it wasn't before though. I mean, it was CB1. No, but you know, it enrolled almost everybody within close walking distance. So I'll be curious to see if parents, you know, from the northeast corner of Tribeca choose 150. It's going to be really interesting to see what they do. Well, and to be fair, when I joined 150 way back when, it really wasn't a neighborhood school. It was a citywide school. It was, and then we became overcrowded, and then it became a neighborhood school. Correct. And Correct. then they also prioritize it to the neighborhood. So Correct. maybe it'll go back to the previous model, Wendy. Which was, it, have... it was uh, one of the reasons I selected it. It was more diverse. And that, in my, in that time in life, that was a positive. In my well, it, might, it might surprise people on this call to hear that even PS 234 at one time had 25% variances. Correct. Right. You know, which is why the bus stop here is really important because there will be a lot of kids coming by bus. Right. A okay, lot more. Thank you for the updates. Can I just speak to the, the whole choice um, issue? Because I think I'm just learning about it now, but Wendy, to your question regarding um, uh, the priority where so. Kelly McGuire, the superintendent, basically said that he would like input from the parents of PS 150 um, via the SLT uh, on what we want going forward, which doesn't necessarily mean we'll get what we want, but at least we get to voice it and you know put our stake in the ground. And um, we're we're just wrapping our heads around it now because I think we do want more diversity. We do appreciate the families that come from further away. Frankly, they're very invested in the school. The fact that they make the effort to come all the way there means that they are very invested. And, um, and you know, then there was a question of, well, how diverse do we want to be? How choice do we want to be? Do we want to retain the priority for the existing schools that have priority now, which are like 234, 276, PAC, Spruce, um, do we want to just open it all up to district two? Do we want to just open it all up period? 
Um, and then that is also now getting mixed up with the whole question of, you know, I had no idea that all the stuff was going on with middle school and high school and the testing and the assignments and uh, all of that stuff. And so we're sort of navigating all of that. So um, yeah, any advice you can give us because you obviously know much more about it and having older children, you've gone through it all, you know, before. So any advice that you could give us in, in the pros and cons of each of these considerations while we're trying to figure out what we want would be extremely helpful and we would much appreciate it. I, I think that, you know, really, you're always going to, at the elementary level, from my experience, you're always going to really attract families that are nearby, you know, because the chances are they have other children that are not that far apart in age and it's hard. It's hard to get a, a young child further away to school than that, you know, and so, and that's why elementary schools are by and large zoned. Um, so what I'm saying to you is, I don't know that it will make that much difference um, in terms of the preference piece um, and to, unless resources are starved in other places. I think that is really always it's going to come back to that with everything, I think. And so, you know, we certainly would have the ability because of the precedences to have a preference for CB1, not a specific neighborhood in CB1, but CB1 in general, because it's elementary, I think. And then you could open it up from there and you could also, Rosa, save a percentage. You know, just declare the percentage as 20% or whatever you would like to, because um, they're also doing that at the middle school level where they're saying we're reserving 20% for kids on free lunch, you know, um, and it's only 17% and 7% respectfully at our middle schools, but at least they're starting to build that up a little bit and, and fortify that diversity through those initiatives if it doesn't, you know, happen naturally. Um, so I don't know if that helped or confused you more, but you know, there's lots of choices about what to, you know, say to them in terms of that model. Um, but I, I do think that it will continue to attract people in the neighborhood. You know, for schools that do have integrated, like basically elementary and middle school continuously in one school, do do the kids from the elementary grades have to actually test and apply to go into the middle school in that same school? Or do they just continue on through until they're done? They have first right of refusal. So it's like 276, they can matriculate from fifth to sixth grade. Um, and that's always been the way with the DOE models for K to eight. I just don't know if this school is set up for K to eight um, in terms of the classroom sizes, you know, cause that, big people, bigger kids have bigger rooms. <laughs> so I don't know if that's a done deal in terms of design. That would be my, my biggest question. Cause I did remember you saying you were considering advocating for K to eight, which is not a bad idea. Um, I would just, we would have to have a design meeting to really see what we're looking at and the gym matters, you know, cause yes. one of the things Mike Marisola said, he's like, he goes, we have an elementary, this is the first time he said it, an elementary sized gym. And I was like, ah, okay. Because if you define it elementary, it means that you don't have to have a regulation gym or commit to a specific size. Even though some of our elementary schools do have a gym you can play sports in, they're not required to. And not only that, there isn't even a specific definition of the size of an elementary gym. Um, so that's problematic if you then have a K to eight because all of our K to eight schools have full size gyms because they need them for their sports programs. And we're already short, so it's not like they could go somewhere else and use somebody else's gym, the sixth through eighth graders. You know, LMC doesn't have one. They have a hell of a time. They use, you know, um, a bunch of different high schools gyms for their basketball program. And I don't know, and it would be a great question for, for um, Bob, if you did have a K to eight, 
what would that look like for that sports program if this is not a regulation gym? Um, Cause you wouldn't want to be sending them away to, you know, the Lower East Side or, you know, neighborhoods away to be able to, to have those after school programs. It, unless you, you know, unless you weigh that out as something that parents don't think is important. You know, that's a, again, another community decision, but it's something to consider for sure. Yeah, they, they're not too far from the Trinity Church gym. The, what? the new uh, Trinity Church. So you are so right, Wendy. Um, we just don't know that the program, you know, what the program at Trinity is gonna be for that gym. I do have a call into them actually, because I saw I was just there last night and saw that it's up and ready to go. Um, so uh, I will bring that back to the next meeting, the update on that. Because that's certainly a possibility if they don't have programming in there during the day that they could then use that gym. Oh, is wow, that that's an amazing it? option. Yeah, if, if, if the school is that. physically unable to accommodate that. I mean, I would tell you right now that um, because of all of the sort of anguish regarding the high school um, admissions process that's happened, and I don't know if it's the same for middle school, but parents are, the freak out is, you know, trickling downwards. And um, the idea that um, there would be some sense of stability of being able to continue through the middle school within, you know, a school, a culture, a community, and a curriculum that we all believe in. Um, right that provides an enormous sense of comfort. And frankly, it's an enormous encouragement for families, even if they're gonna to have to move, you know, travel further south from the current location to get to, they're willing to do it if they know that they're gonna be in the school for 10 years and, and possibly even longer because they have multiple children. That's a, that's a worthwhile investment to them. Whereas, right. if, whereas if without a middle school, I think there, there would, probably be more loss of the families that we currently have in the school. Um, because, it, you know, they're like, should I, do I want to make that trek for another one to two years? Um, that kind of thinking. So right. I think and it's actually critical to the have, continuation of the school. We don't have a choice K to eight down here. And there's an argument for that, you know? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. so we should do a, I think I will ask when he gets back to me about the gymatorium side, I will ask him um, for the, uh, you know, what the, if the classrooms could accommodate K to eight. Well, I think okay, thank you. What's that? Bruce is just too great to do class on grade. Is that right? In middle school, is that right? Yes. Uh, um, so the one thing, um, you know, I, I don't, I just don't know enough about that middle school, how, you know, they often have had too small of a population to have a full battery of some sports and clubs and things like that. So I just think the 150 parents should also think about that, make sure they're ready for a small school, middle school. It's a different experience. I mean, it's one thing when your kids are in middle school, but uh, or in elementary school. Um, I personally think it was really good for all of my kids to go from a one class per grade school to bigger, much bigger, in some cases, middle school. It was good to mix it up. Um, oh, I yes. don't, you know, but obviously uh, I understand too. Everything's different. It's not the way it used to be. No, but you're, Wendy, that's a great point that's worth thinking through. Um, cause I, I think you would end up at 2 classes on a grade, maybe 3. Um, no, that we were saying 2, given the number of classrooms. Yeah. I just think some people should go over to spruce then and ask the middle school parents. What right. are the ones of going to a 2 class per grade middle school? Um, you know, it, it might be fine. People might be perfectly fine with it, but, uh, I do know they were having trouble, you know, just filling certain teams. They couldn't yeah. offer everything. Right, right, right. Oh, yeah, and that never occurred to me. Thank you. Yeah. And, I, you know, I just want to thank both of you guys for um, being in this for the long haul and for being so invested in the success of the school, which, you know, our community is going to, you know, get to benefit from and for like caring so much about the details and following through. It's your dedication is just like awesome. And I just want to thank you from the bottom of my heart.
Well, the last up. person that wants to see 150 go down is me. I want it to live forever, and I'm I'm sad that it's changed, but you know that's inevitable. It change it changes every year, but it's really going to change. Um, so it's it's wonderful that the parents are still hanging in there. Listen, there's going to be a new principal too, which I just heard. So yes. you know that that's a big change as well. Judas, yes. did you want to say something? I see your hand up. Judith? Maybe not. Okay. Anyone else? Um, oh, I'm here. Sorry. It was up from before. Um, I think everyone else addressed my, my questions. Okay. All right. Great, everybody. Well, if there's no other comments or questions, um, that's all we have for tonight. So, hey, Tricia, is, uh, are you talking directly with Kelly or if there's a meeting that you have with Kelly at some point, can I hop on the call and just listen in? Yeah, I mean, I don't know that I'll, I'll it'll end up being a, a meeting format. Um, it probably will just be email with him. Um, I think that the meeting format would be more likely to be with the SCA. So, um, so I'll let you know, um, those tend to just be with Tammy. So it just yeah. depends. And, you know, I, and if it doesn't work out, that's fine. I, I promise not to talk, but I, I'll be, I would listen in and then text you my, okay. uh, my concerns. <laughs> All right, good. Well, I'm going to Governor's Island tomorrow because there's a walkabout and a press event about the pool. And um, everyone's going to be there. The new chancellor's going to be there. The, Margaret's going to be there. Everybody's going to say thank you and take lots of pictures. And That's we found out that the courtyard's only 40 feet wide. So here we go again, right? Like, oh my God. So, <laughs> so I got to march over there and really advocate for making sure that we maximize these resources they're about to spend so much money on. Um, and Even uh, Manhattan Youth Gym, which was marketed to the neighborhood as a Olympic length swimming pool. It was 25 yards long, but it was only four lanes wide. So, you know, you have to be very careful what they're saying, because when I finally got in there and I said, what do you mean it's only four lanes wide? You know, not six lanes like a normal pool. Um, right. So those things matter. Yeah, it matters a lot. And so we're gonna go take a look and say thank you and oh what about that <laughs> okay um so yeah so you know i think it's all about getting in early with these things so um so rosa thank you for passing that on to me that was a really important moment because they have not committed to some of these uh things yet that you might be able to change if you do want that k to eight and rosa are you on the pta and the slt no, I'm only on the SLT. There's only so much I can manage. <laughs> Which is perfectly um, fine, but I just wondered if both the SLT and the PTA, uh, you know, it sounds like you're doing everything you can over there to to meet. If if they have a community meeting, because uh, sometimes like when we were doing the save PS1 way back when, we would have community meetings and invite outside people in. Um, you know, that's not a terrible idea if you do that. I'm I mean, I, I, not that you have more meetings, but um, I'd be we happy to show up. We have the next one scheduled for June 22nd, and I'm going to ask Kelly if it's all right to invite you guys. Oh, that's I was election. Wondering if I, that. I would love to listen First, in on that, Rosa. That, that second is election primary day, right? Yes. Um, I'm yeah. Primaries all day from 5 a.m. to 10 p.m. I'm working the polls again. So uh, I would love so to. Definitely. Uh, please do send that to us. I'll just sit in the background, but it'd be great to hear. Okay, definitely. And I will give you guys email updates as, as I've been doing. All right. Thanks very much. And thank you, everyone. Yeah, and everybody vote on primary day. I'll be there. <laughs> Good night. Thank you. Good night. Bye. Good night. Thank you. Good night.